All right, sure, go ahead, thanks. So here's a 55 year old man with some uh, shortness of breath and an abnormal chest radiograph. Uh, very busy looking, concentrated in upper and mid parts of the lung. And uh, on CT, it's confirmed to be abnormal. This kind of lacy interstitial abnormality and a few holes in the lung with fairly thick rims and then a lot of ground glass abnormality in the bases. So uh, he is a cigarette smoker. He uh, had a transbronchial biopsy and a diagnosis of Langerhans cell histiocytosis was made. So this is really fierce looking lung disease. And he's been treated with steroids. He's gotten a little bit better, but uh, he's, his smoking history, he's not he quit smoking altogether. He says he smokes about four cigarettes a day, but he seems to um, start smoking again and then stop smoking. And it's hard to tell what he's, uh, what he's really up to and smoking, smoking wise. So this is very scary looking lung disease. And I think with this big, ground glass component in the basis, I would wonder if he also has some DIP uh, as part of his smoking-related lung disease. Yeah, one would think so for sure. It's so extensive, huh? Right. And basal predominant ground glass is a great pattern for uh, DIP. Yeah, very much so. Here's a person who is examined uh, because of trauma and has an abnormal chest radiograph with this upper mediastinal abnormality. Seems to be pretty extensive here. Abnormal contour back here. And an abnormality that goes all the way down actually. So somewhat obscuring the back wall of the heart, but it goes all the way down. So we see an elongated abnormality like this, especially with a fluid level in it up here. Think of the possibility of achalasia and uh, he did have some barium studies. The interesting thing is on initial swallowing, the barium seems to go right by this big abnormality, just seems to stream right down. You wouldn't suspect from this that there's an abnormality of the uh, esophageal dimensions. But as we keep on going, you see that more and more of this fills out now and begin to fill the whole space there. So this very dilated esophagus Looks initially normal, I think, because the contrast just streams down a few of the rugae or the striations in the esophagus and gets all the way down here. The lower aspect, we do have a pretty good beak on the esophagus there. There's no evidence of a mass causing obstruction. So a dramatic presentation of achalasia in a trauma, trauma patient, very abnormal chest radiograph and not because of trauma. Yeah. How old is he, David? How long has he lived with this? Uh, the person was 50 at the time of uh, those studies, and I don't know what his history was in terms of whether there were any preceding symptoms. Wow. Here's a young woman, 21 years old, with pulmonary hypertension. It's um, called idiopathic. We can see the main pulmonary arteries dilated. The interlobe, our right pulmonary artery, is big. Heart's um, on the big side of normal and intravenous catheter for therapy for this pulmonary hypertension is in place and the lungs look kind of busy so busy looking lungs she did have um, the ct scan which shows some ground glassy abnormalities um, and excess of small little dots like this representing local very local you know, aneurysms of these uh, arterioles. So enlarged, some, some dot-like enlargement and with surrounding ground glass is what you see with plexiform arteriopathy in the setting of uh, pulmonary hypertension. So here's another one of those little dots. So these uh, sudden changes in caliber of the vessels and then some smudgy ground glass around it. It's great for plexiform arteriopathy. Let me show what it looks like on, I think I've got a MIPS for you here. The MIPS brings out these, these little dots. And if you look down here, for instance, uh, these tiny little aneurysms of these arterioles is, is part of this process. And then often the surrounding smudge of ground glass. 
So at uh, lung transplant, she had bilateral lung transplant. There was indeed plexiform arteriopathy. When you see ground glass, you have to worry, could this be, um, was it not Langerhans cell histiocytosis, but um, pulmonary venous, um, not venoocclusive disease, but that PCLH or whatever it's called, uh, capillary, yeah, pulmonary capillary hemangiomatosis. She doesn't have that much ground glass to strongly suspect that. And it was not that on path, it was just plexiform arteriopathy. Let's look at her mediastinum because she does have a big right heart and very big um, pulmonary artery centrally. Yeah. And then this person has what looks like a horrible pneumonia in this right lung base. And this is 20, that's 2015. Uh, the amazing thing is that this pneumonia is still there a few years later. This is now 2019. So persisting pneumonia over such a long period of time. Let's look back at the lateral view and we see that this person has very dramatic pectus excavatum. And the lower lobe where we thought we should be seeing pneumonia is actually fairly clear. Here's the 2019 lateral view and it shows that there's really not much in the lung at all, but instead there's this big pectus deformity here. So this is a pectus pseudo-pneumonia. She did have a, a limited CT. This is really abdominal CT. And you can see from this that the lung bases are pretty clear. There's just a little bit of atelectasis. She's got this severe deformity of her sternum. And it's often, often pectus is asymmetric with a sternum tilting like this with more indentation on the right than the left. So it sometimes has a kind of a check mark uh, appearance to it. And then she's had implants placed to partly to fill this pectus uh, divot in her anterior chest. So a bigger implant on the right than the left. And it's all of this opacity from this implant that is causing the uh, whiteness that it looks like pneumonia at first, first glance. So pectus pseudo-pneumonia, rather dramatic case. In this case, part of the extra whiteness is this impl implant here, which is designed to help cosmetically cover the pectus defect. Mm. Okay. Can you show us the frontal again one more time? One of the frontal radiographs? Here's the current, um, the 2019 oh. frontal radiograph and the 2015. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, good case of being full. Uh, pectus, pectus pneumonia. I think I would fall for this one every time without a lateral view. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Travis, you have cases? Yeah. Okay, there you go. It's got pretty sparse attendance today. I only have four, so we'll we'll see. Good. This is a trauma case and um if I can get it to load. And I think it's interesting on a couple of different fronts. And this is the initial radiograph. And you can see there's subcutaneous emphysema bullet overlying the upper chest, some abnormality in the left lung that's relevant here. Now, there's also subcutaneous emphysema down lower. And, and you'll see on the CT that there's additional injury and additional bullet. And um, I think this is this is a, a young woman who was involved in a, in a gunshot, in, in a shooting. And, you know, bullets it's always important to identify any entry and exit wounds and try and trace a straight line but understands that, that bullets can certainly ricochet especially and deflect especially when they change densities of of tissue planes and and whatnot but so she got shot here once and you can see this thing nearly hit but missed her her um, internal mammary vessels and a nice linear laceration through the left upper lobe, through the superior segment of the left lower lobe. And then it must have hit off a rib because there are a couple of fragments here and there was a rib that was slightly, you know, slightly deformed right here. And then this was the bullet that was actually all the way up here at the top. So this one had deflected upward after it had gone through the lung. 
and really not much hemothorax, but I think the, the lower injury is more interesting um, because you see in the left lower lobe that there's an area of contusion and, and what turned out actually to be at laceration as well, uh, but you don't actually see, well, and I, I'm not actually sure how much of this is laceration, but there's certainly some, but a lot of blood from contusion. And it's kind of interesting to figure out how the, bu the, the bullet actually got there because there's nothing through the heart. And it's only when you look inferiorly, you see that there was an entry wound here by the costal cartilage, a laceration of the liver, and that this went right under the heart and if I look on a sagittal, you'll see, I think we can theorize the patient was probably inhaling more when, when she was actually shot because the, the bullet tract is in the liver below this level of lung that was injured. And then the bullet, or maybe it was just at an angle, but then the bullet went posteriorly. And the question is, where is the bullet? And you'll see here, and the reason I actually saw this case is that the bullet happens to be down here, posterior to the spleen, and of course the spleen and kidney weren't injured, and we suspect this might actually be in the pleural space. So they went in, there was a diaphragmatic injury, no surprise, the bullet and the liver laceration that were repaired. The heart and the pericardium were okay. They didn't take out the bullet, and then you can see, the reason I saw this, I saw a follow-up study on this patient, this was around the time of the incident, and then this is several years later. So she's recovered well, but she has a wandering bullet. So not a thoracolith, or I guess you could say it's a thoracolith of some sort, but it's clearly in the pleural space and migrating. So you know, just important to remember, just because you see a bullet somewhere doesn't mean that's where it actually originated, and it may be moving around as it was in this case. Oh, really? Yeah, and she was obviously quite fortunate with missing a lot of important things. Yeah. Now, this case, let me make sure I get the correct radiograph. Let's see, which one is it? This radiograph. I think this is, um, you know, this was done in July, and I think it's, and I am not implying that, that this was done by an intern because I don't actually think it was, but we seem, seem to see these types of things more earlier on than we do later on. But this is a patient who's in the ICU and getting their daily radiographs. They've had a, a recent lung transplant, as you can see, and they have issues with the lungs, but they have the typical chest tubes. Tra they've been trached at this point because they were trached before their lung transplant. Uh, large bore ECMO catheters. and you know, I would admit that this would be easy to overlook, especially if you're just going through a, a busy, big stack of films and didn't have the history, but the history here was right subclavian catheter placement. And I'm actually curious why they got the radiograph, because when I read the procedure note, you'll see here's the right subclavian catheter. It takes an abnormally high course and crosses midline. We can see their bilateral internal jugular central venous catheter is going the expected location. And this clearly not going the expected location. And one would surmise it's probably in the descending thoracic aorta if it's not extravascular, given this high and medial approach. And this was actually an arterial placement. It was recognized at the time based on, uh, I think, the, the type of blood being returned and also the, the pulsation from it. So when this happens or when you see this, obviously the first thing to do is not just to panic and yank out the catheter and they didn't, um, they did a CT and you will see this was the CT that was done and the catheter going directly into the subclavian artery right here. And I looked at the note too, this was also, this was a blind stick not done under ultrasound according to their note. They have retracted at some, it's no longer in the arch, it's just in the brachiocephalic artery. Um, but the, um, you know, oftentimes they have to do, to do an open repair of this so that they can, you know, suture back the, the vessel since an aortotomy and a dilation's already occurred. In this case, I, and I unfortunately don't have images of it, but the vascular surgeons removed this under fluoroscopy and applied uh, a balloon 
uh, occlusion from internal approach. So they had a balloon catheter in the subclavian artery and just held pressure internally as they pulled it out. And this was a follow-up CT they did. And you can see that there's like really maybe a little bit of surrounding blood product at external of the vessel, but you know, no significant stenosis or pseudoaneurysm of this vessel. And this was only a couple of days after they took it out. So um, a good minimally invasive approach for repair or for, for achieving hemostasis in this patient that had an arterial catheter placed. And so just to go back to this again, you know, this is why I preach to the, our residents and fellows, especially in daily ICUs, like don't look at the lungs and don't just say lines and tubes stable. Like for me, at least I have to enumerate everything and this could be easily, to, easily overlooked if you're not cognizant of it. Wow. Travis, is that a venovenous ECMO cannula, the big one? Yeah. I've not seen one placed via the subclavian. I, I believe it is, yeah. It's a very large caliber thing going via the subclavian, is it? Wow, it yeah, is. Yeah, you're right. So yeah. Probably a uh, so-called dual channel venovenous ECMO. Yeah, it is because actually... Yeah, and, and Howard, I think you spent more time studying these than I have, but yeah, you can see that there, that in fact it is two channels, because you can see the different lumens right there, and one actually surrounds the other. I was looking at this as I was putting this together, because I noticed that the tip of this, as I scroll towards the superior vena cava, you almost wonder, is there thrombus or something in it? But I think it's just that it's the different levels of opacification and you have one that's emptying here and one that's emptying more inferiorly yeah or, or one that's what that's draining more inferiorly is that your understanding yeah it's dual channel i don't yeah know if i recognize the actual product and that's this is the first one i've seen that has been placed via a subclavian rather than a jugular vein that's unusual Yeah, they are. They have a central. They have an internal jugular central venous catheter on that side already. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe they just. I haven't. I haven't seen enough to know the practice patterns here at Duke yet. But. Okay. All right, and Howard, I think you in particular are going to enjoy this one because this is a uh, finding that you taught me about. Not not the one on the lateral view, but clearly we can see this patient has an enlarged cardiac silhouette and you know, on the lateral view, this is one of the best examples of, of a fat pad or so-called Oreo cookie sign that I've seen, where of course the fluid here is the stuffing, the mediastinal fat and then the epicardial fat form the two layer, the darker layers. And I know Howard, you've pointed out on multiple times other findings that you can see with pericardial effusion. And I noticed it in this one here which is the similar fat pad sign yeah. on the PA radiograph of the same thing. Now, does this have a separate name other than just a fat pad sign on the anterior radiograph or not? Yeah, I think it might be just called the epicardial fat sign of pericardial effusion. And it's really unusual because you have to have just the right amount of fat and catch it in profile in tangent. Yeah. Yeah, but I thought you'd like this one because yeah. I saw this yesterday, and and uh, the, yeah, the, the resident was pointing out the Oreo cookie sign on the lateral view, and then I saw the frontal view and and saw that and figured I would share that. But this is a patient who he was going to get an echo yesterday. He had an echo a few months ago, normal heart, um, no pericardial effusion at that time, so may have pericarditis. Not sure at this point. It's quite a bit of fluid, I think, for something acute. So haven't gotten the full picture yet but certainly the imaging is 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 diagnostic of an effusion yes wow good one all right and then one more i didn't show this before but i will now and this patient 27 this patient's been seen in in the the duke system for years so this is one of the nice things when you move somewhere else is you get plugged into see patients that have interesting diagnoses that have been there for quite some time. And this is a patient who, I don't know why they originally had a neck CT 
Um, but it was noticed that this patient had some weird stuff in their anterior mediastinum. And you can see that they have a fairly dilated uh, brachiocephalic vein and a weird vascular structure here. And that was on an XCT. So of course that prompted uh, further chest imaging. And I've only pulled up representative images, but this is one from a few years ago now, and it's been mostly MR and I'll show you in a moment. But we see this anterior mediastinal you know, thing or lesion for lack of a better term. And there's a lot of fat and soft tissue interspersed here. There are some little punctate areas of calcification. Of course, we, you know, this doesn't look like a, a true like discrete tumor per se. And the more you look, you see some of these dilated channels look like they're vessels. In fact, you can see some, as you can see here, there's some direct communication or macroscopic communication with the left brachiocephalic vein. So this is a really good look for at least a venous malformation or hemangioma like we've seen. And this one actually has quite a bit of lymphatic connection as well. So this ends up being a, a lymphatic venous malformation. And I've got, uh, I've got MR as well. And she's had been followed with MR. And you can see there's a lot of, of T2 intense areas in this and some that are lower signal intensity, but a pretty characteristic look. And I think the see the post contrasts are nice here because they actually really nicely show this big venous communication with the subclavian vein that you see here. And so it's a combination, it's a complex lesion with a combination of both lymphatic and venous components. And it has slowly been getting bigger. They've um, they've done some embolization in the past, I believe. You know, try tried to do some. It's still growing slowly. I'm not sure what the the end result will be in this case. I think she's now at least 10 years since diagnosis, and they're just continuing to watch. Um, you know, these are complex. Obviously, I pulled up the you know the uh, most recent. I guess I don't know what the stands for. Society of Vascular something but they have a whole complex classification system of vascular malformations. And I think in this case, you have a lymphatic malformation and you have a venous malformation. So LM and BM. And so this becomes a combined lesion, as you can see here. So a combined lymphatic and venous malformation. Mm -hmm. So these are two or more malformations seen together. That's and I've, we've seen several of these and, and shown multiple you know, hemangiomas and vascular malformations throughout the mediastinum, and this one has a mix of both. Yep. I've seen a few of these, but I've never seen one in which one can see an actual draining vessel to a brachial yeah. like that. That is really interesting. Yeah. That's quite a, it's quite a big vein. And let's see, this is a little bit more delayed. And so you can see just how it brings out some of these veins. And so you're presumably getting a lot of collaterals from thymic veins and thyroid veins. And, and you can even see some here from the chest wall. So internal mammary veins and I see. Yeah. Maybe it's more a vascular malformation than a lymphatic one, as it were. Yeah. But there were, they've done, I didn't include, they've done lymphangiograms on this patient too, filling this thing. I see. And I don't really understand why you would have a, a combination of both, but. No, no. Yeah, it, it is a complex lesion. Yeah. The other thing with the, the macroscopic communication here with the veins is being, you know, them being careful of what they try to embolize and how they try to do it. And obviously evaluate, make sure this patient doesn't have a shunt that would, could potentiate any sort of systemic embolization, but that's outside of my, my realm of, of expertise in this case. Right. Hmm. Okay. All right, Howard, that's it for me. Thanks. Okay, give me a moment, I'll bring mine up.
Okay, let's start with an interstitial lung disease. I'm showing you this one in part because I do have path images to show you. So on radiography, there really is just a low profusion of bibasilar reticular opacities. This is a CT from April. So I'll make that big and scroll through that. I think the first comment one can make is that on a scale of severity, this is relatively mild disease. At this point, I think we would describe this as reticulation, subplural. Beginning to see perhaps a little subplural cystic change in one area, but just a little only. As we go down, again, basically subpleural reticulation. The same as we go down. They are becoming a little bit more profuse here. I noticed a few small punctate calcifications or ossifications down here, but sparse. I don't think I saw anywhere any subpleural traction bronchiolectasis. There are no subpleural cystic spaces. There are no foci away from the pleural surface of traction bronchiectasis, but just reticulation and small areas, of course, of ground glass opacity only. So I suppose if a question came up depending on the context of, say, UIP, I think that one would reasonably say this is indeterminate for that. Clearly, one would like to get a history. In other words, is this something that might be associated with a connective tissue disorder? But the patient does not have that. Not all of the patients that go to lung biopsy here go through our multidisciplinary conference. Some seem to be referred directly to the surgeons. So I can't make any particular diagnosis. I can just describe it. And let's see what we have here. So I'll just go up. That's not what I want to do. So, so far, the pathologist comment, very minimal changes overall some mild interstitial inflammation described like that, mostly airway centric. So this would be a so-called minimal change biopsy where so many of these interalveolar septa look completely normal, not NSIP. Here is a loose granuloma near an airway. A few foci in which there is some fibrosis described as airway centric fibrosis. Here again, minimal airway centric changes, lots of normal alveoli otherwise. Some abnormality here, a rare septal or paraseptal fibroblast focus. Here is a focus of osseous metaplasia or a dendriform ossification corresponding to one of the ones that I saw. If so, you know, what would one label this as? I don't know. If you have a granuloma and you have airway centric disease, I think one would think of an inhalational disorder like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Is this enough to describe this as a fibrotic HP? I don't really know. But I think this is fairly common. Sometimes you can have findings and not necessarily put it into a particular category. So David or Travis, I mean, you've seen cases like this, presumably at your ILD conference, and there may be cases just like this where you can't necessarily put a name to it like this. Yeah, correct. How old is the patient? This patient is 73. I mean, this, these are the ones where they just have to do extensive connective tissue disease and and um, exposure workups and, you know, 
family history and and see what they figure out. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. Yeah, and this is quite common actually. <clears throat> I think that pathologists recognize now that a lot of the cases they get in consultation anyway, particularly in a consultation service, are difficult because the easy ones are not sent to them. The easy ones, the diagnosis is made even without any pathology, of course. So they have to deal with more cases that are simply hard, certainly hard to fit into any particular diagnostic category. So they might say, well, maybe this is HP, but and there's a little fibrosis, so maybe it's fibrotic HP or simply indeterminate. And at some point, it's fine not to try and fix this into a box. And that's not uncommon in my experience. Yeah. Yeah. Howard, was that a man or a woman? This is a, a man. And I wonder, wonder about his occupational exposures. Um, as far as I could tell, there, there was nothing that I could find in the record that pointed to a particular occupation that I know of in terms of an inhalational disorder of some kind. Yeah. Okay, let me bring up this one. I'll bring up the lateral next to it. So clearly we have mediastinal contour abnormality. We have a large lesion here that on the lateral projection is here. And in looking beyond that, because initially one would think this is a mediastinal mass, let me show you a really subtle finding and you'll see that it's going to turn out to be something. So this is really subtle, but just here is a somewhat oval shaped opacity. And that's really how big it is. And perhaps it corresponds with that. But it turns out that this is real and it is indeed an abnormality related to a portion of the right major fissure or the interlobar fissures. So if we have a big mediastinal lesion and you keep on looking elsewhere and now begin to wonder whether they are plural based lesions associated with it, one of which really subtle is associated with the interlobar fissures, then I think you can tell in which direction I'm going if you have a mediastinal mass with plural lesions. So I'll bring up the axial here and show you the mediastinal lesion. And I'll show you this here in a moment in the sagittal plane, because you can see it better. But we begin to look for plural based lesions and here is one here. And let me bring up the sagittal and I'll just put that in the lung window actually to show you the corresponding finding right here. So that is pleural based tumor and you can see it has a shape that's influenced by its location at the junction of the minor fissure and the major fissure as you see here. So of course with that we would typically think of a thymoma with already at the time of diagnosis spread so-called drop metastases in relation to pleural membranes. Anyone think of any alternative lesion? It really ought to be that. Huh? They are the FDG avid lesions. So this one turns out to be pathologically actually a thymic carcinoma. And there are various ways that a pathologist can try to distinguish between a thymoma and a thymic carcinoma. This one actually had, by virtue of 
synaptophysin positivity, features of neuroendocrine differentiation. Thymic carcinomas pathologically can have a whole variety of histopathologies from squamous cell cancers to sarcomas to neuroendocrine features. So this one is a poorly differentiated thymic cancer with neuroendocrine differentiation. One way that pathologists distinguish between a thymoma and a thymic carcinoma is that typically with a thymoma, you have immature lymphocytes, and the cell surface marker for that is TDT. That's not present in a thymic carcinoma, which doesn't, doesn't have these so-called immature lymphocytes as part of the lesion, even though, of course, those tumors are epithelial cell tumors, not lymphocyte tumors. But that's one way they can distinguish that, as well as some other cell surface markers between thymic carcinoma and thymoma. So really unfortunate case presented at diagnosis with a lot of disease like that. Let me show you this one, really interesting. So I came across this radiograph, and I'll show you in a moment the history, which was of a respiratory illness, but it didn't seem severe. And I'll bring up the lateral projection. So there is ill-defined opacity in the right lower lobe. And of course, I wasn't certain whether associated with it was potentially some regional lymph node enlargement. Let me bring this up because I noticed when I read the radiograph that away from the opacity, I saw septal lines. Now they're kind of subtle on the radiograph, but you'll see in a moment that these turn out to be real, that they are septal lines. So when I saw that, I was really worried about a lung cancer. A lung cancer with lymphangetic tumor spread, a lung cancer with potentially lymph node disease associated with it, but he's a relatively young person and not a smoker. So I certainly recommended further evaluation with the CT. So let me show you the CT. And you will see already that there is substantial lymph node enlargement, even in the paratracheal region, and a fair amount there, and more of the same in relation to subcoronal lymph nodes, but also in relation to intrapulmonary lymphoid tissue there. Now we see the lymph node enlargement, but now the pulmonary abnormality. So extensive regional lymph node enlargement, and that is the pulmonary abnormality. And you can see its relationship to the pulmonary vessels there. And indeed, yes, there are indeed septal lines and peribronchial fluid cuffs and small nodules. And that's really interesting, I think. The edema is confined to the right lower lobe. And I followed that up to see what would happen. And I'll show you kind of curiously that I've got some notes I can show you here. But this is the history. And here you can see the patient's note. So the patient went to get a workup in Arizona. And here's the copy and paste of the patient's note. So saying that they diagnosed him with coccidioidomycosis. On the men now, CT scan was scary. So that's really interesting. So I wonder, you know, I. I've seen cases of, say, mucomycosis, and I think we've all seen that, where you have big lesions, but you also have interstitial edema in the affected lobe. So I speculate, I wonder whether there's so much involvement of lymphoid tissue that maybe there is sort of a impaired lymphatic venous drainage from that lobe via afferent to efferent to afferent to efferent lymphatics because of so much nodal disease. What do you think about that as a potential explanation in a patient like this?
That makes sense. Yeah. Quite impressive. I, I like it. I mean, we certainly see it. Yeah. We certainly see it. Very interesting. So rather have coxie than a primary tumor, of course. And yeah, there you go. I don't know how they diagnose it exactly, but I think they could have done a biopsy or serology or combinations thereof. There was quite a bit of tissue that one could sample, I think, through the bronchoscope. If that's what they did, if that's what they did, yeah. It's actually quite a bit of lymphadenopathy for coxie. It is a lot, isn't it? <clears throat> it's generally pretty mild. And the interesting thing about coxie is you don't see much in the way of residual calcified nodules. Sometimes you'll see one small nodule, but it tends not to leave behind very much compared to, say, histoplasmosis, which likes, likes to leave behind lots of traces, you know, calcified nodes, calcified nodules. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting case as well. Um, this is a patient with, let me just see if I've got the right one. Okay. There is a long history here, and I'll show you that in a moment, of a biliary tract cancer. And this patient has um, survived for a long time. Well, let me actually bring up the history here to see the history. So this started in 2015. Diagnosed with pulmonary metastases in 2017. Um, has done well, but then has progressed quite a bit since November of 2020. There's a result of a recent CT guided biopsy showing findings consistent with metastatic cholangiocarcinoma. I think this is a nice example of a growth pattern which isn't just nodules but really consolidation so this may be a form now we just have a ct guided biopsy rather than an open lung biopsy but i wonder to what extent there is tremendous growth of tumor in the air spaces along interalveolar septa kind of a lipidic growth pattern for this i've seen this a few times with both pancreatic as well as biliary tree cancers a pattern that i that sort of simulates consolidation and lipidic growth pattern. Now, of course, there are lots of nodules too, but it looks very consolidative, particularly down here in the lower lungs. And I would speculate that it's growing in that fashion, at least perhaps in part now. There's a lot of mucin there and described as infiltrating through lung tissue. To me, that all corresponds quite nicely with what I see on the imaging here in terms of a growth pattern, just extensive infiltration, mucin production, well, intracytoplasmic mucin at least. But I think you guys have shown cases like this with pancreatic and biliary tree particularly, a pattern that looks like a consolidative um, lipidic growth pattern of metastatic yeah. neurocarcinoma. I know I've seen it I can't like long primaries, but it seems to it's usually an adenocarcinoma that likes to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This one is interesting. It wasn't actually done to evaluate for pulmonary embolism, but I'll show you some images here. So Imagine if this was a CTPA for pulmonary embolism in this patient. And we have an appearance of opacification of the pulmonary arteries that looks like this. So we have great opacification of the main pulmonary artery and the left, but if I scroll down here, for example, not so much of the right pulmonary artery or the pulmonary arteries in the right lung compared to those in the left lung. This could potentially be an issue with 
a diminished sensitivity for the detection of emboli in the right lung vessels. So as you may have seen already, we do have a device in the left pulmonary artery, in the pulmonary artery, the tip of which ends up right there. So this is a patient with extracorporeal right ventricular assistance. So blood is being taken out of the right atrium. There's the atrial cannula, pumped outside of the body and delivered back via this cannula to the pulmonary artery right there. So of course the blood coming back from this cannula doesn't contain the kind of contrast medium delivered via the superior vena cava. It's kind of diluting the contrast medium out. So I've not encountered this before, but I was thinking if this was intended to be a CTPA and you knew the anatomy and you knew the presence of the cannula there, would you just do it in the usual fashion or perhaps would you ask the surgeon to clamp off this cannula just for a few seconds while you inject contrast medium in the usual way? I've not encountered that before. I know I've modified the technique in patients on a central AV ECMO, but this is a little bit different from that, a different situation. Any thoughts? But I just thought that the physiology was interesting and could explain why we have asymmetric opacification. Yeah. Yeah, I think the study was done because of um, a concern about bleeding uh, and wasn't done for PE. Oh, there's your LVAD. So you've got the LVAD and you've got your extracorporeal RVAD set up. All right. Here is a patient with just a, some variant anatomy. So here is a small outpouching or diverticulum, if you, if you like, arising from the anterior aspect of the superior portion of left atrium. And I've seen this before, um, not, not rarely, not, not commonly. But this is the kind of outpouching that we do see occasionally. And really, that's just it. It's just an outpouching. So Travis, I'm sure you've probably seen that. And I would just report it as a little diverticulum or outpouching and say it's of no significance. And so, sorry, go ahead. Have, yeah, they, they're also referred to as just as accessory left atrial appendages. Yeah. Right in that location. Yeah. Right. And yeah, so here's a nice you know, anatomically, I don't know, I don't know if it's actually been looked at, but that's what a lot of the literature refers to that as. Yeah. Yeah, either accessory atrial appendages or diverticular or outpouchings. This is quite a nice article on outpouchings in different places. Here's one that they have here in relation to the left atrium. But Do they make any distinction between the two? Yeah. Let's see if they make a distinction between the diverticulum and the outpouching. Um, accessory appendages formed along the lines of fusion, narrow neck with irregular cauliflower-like surface. Okay. In contrast, diverticula are commonly located in the anterosuperior wall of the left atrium and generally have a broad base or wide neck with a smooth surface. Oh, it's interesting that they seem to imply that maybe diverticular have been seen in association with arrhythmias and thromboembolism, but we probably have a spectrum bias there and a selection bias. Okay, I'll have to read that article again. But I've seen this before. Usually they're a bit smaller, and I've seen them typically in that location and just describe them as exactly that, a little outpouching or diverticulum. Okay, 
I think we should stop there. I've got a few more, but I think I'm going to save those. And one I've shown last week. All right, very good. I think that is Thanks. of us for today. All right, have a good afternoon, everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Howard. For okay, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.